Hello and welcome to our long anticipated review of Scythe from Stonemeyer Games. So this is a game that our fans have been asking me to give a second shot for a long time. And thanks to Jamie at Stonemeyer Games, who offered us a review copy, we're finally able to give it a second try. Now, Scythe was designed by Jamie Stegmeyer, features some awesome and evocative artwork from Jacob Wolzowski, graphic design by Christine Santana, and a solo, solo, solo mode? I don't even know what I was trying to say. Solo mode from Morton Monrad Penderson. Pederson. I should almost just start over. I'm botching all the names tonight. Sorry about that, all of you. Uh, Scythe was originally published in 2016 by Jamie's own company, Stonemeyer Games, and has pretty much been a hit since then. Scythe, with just the base game, plays one to five players, with games taking an hour or two, depending on the player count, with your first couple games taking significantly longer. If, by chance like us, you already don't like Scythe for one reason or another, either from a poor experience in person or the bizarre way of teaching that I found they had in the digital app, I urge you to listen in and maybe give it another chance. Now, I'm pretty sure Scythe is an evergreen product by Stonemeyer at this point. Uh, it's very much still in print and can usually be picked up for less than the MSRP, which is 124 Canadian or 99 US. For example, right now you can go to Stonemeyer's website and get it for 99 Canadian or 85 US. Now, there are many varied expansions for this game, but tonight we are only talking about and looking at the base box, the core box, if you will. Okay, so what is Scythe? Is it a war game, mech battle, skirmish? It's not immediately obvious, I must say. So I gotta say, those three do really focus on combat, and that is definitely not what Scythe is all about. In Scythe, you take on the role of the leader of one of the five factions in Europe in a 1920s that never was. A war-torn land of farmers and fields, monuments, and mecca. This is a diesel punk battlefield where you're vying for dominance of the land surrounding the factory. Now, gameplay is actually an asymmetric mix of worker placement, area control, engine building, and exploration, with players only taking one or two actions each turn, lending to a quick turnaround and faster than expected gameplay. In the end, though, it's the faction with the most money that wins the game with coin earned for accomplishing goals, area control, and resource buildup, as well as the value being affected by your faction's popularity at the end of the game. This is a medium to heavy Euro game with a very low random factor and a pretty steep learning mm -hmm. curve, where each individual action is simple enough to learn, but figuring out how they all interact and work together is going to take more than just a couple of plays. Yes. Now, with that overview, let's talk a little bit about component quality, starting by pointing everyone to our Scythe unboxing video on YouTube. Through that, you can see Mo take apart the box bit by bit and show off the excellent component quality you get in this game. So Scythe has a lot of moving parts in it, and a lot of things going on, and that's actually also reflected in its components. You get character models and mechas and plastic. You get wooden meeples, each of which has a unique design for each of the five factions. You get a rather large hex filled board with places to put many of the game's cards and to track things like power and popularity. So the board is noteworthy because it's two sided with the second side featuring a much larger hex. To use this side of the board, though, you do need the scythe board extension, which is sold separately and we haven't tried. I gotta say, as it is, it's already a big board. So you're gonna need a pretty big table if you do get that expansion. Now you get wooden resources in four types, all denoted both by color and shape, which is a nice touch. Wooden buildings for each faction, star tokens, and other wooden tracking markers. Along with this are a few deck of cards, some tiles. These include faction abilities, combat cards, personal goals, encounter cards, reference cards, and cards for playing solo. The game also comes with some cardboard punch boards for money and counter tokens, power dials, structure bonus tiles, and probably something else I'm forgetting. Again, there's lots of stuff. As you can see in the unboxing, you get a ton of stuff in this box, which honestly does help justify the rather high price point on this game. The quality on all these components is pretty much top notch, yeah. with extra thought given to the component 
types. For example, it matters in the game if a unit is made of wood or plastic. Mm -hmm. An easy way to tell what abilities work with what units and what units can produce resources and what units can take part in battle. Nice. Now, our only complaint about any of this is the fact is that the board is quite dull and it can be hard to tell the various hex regions apart. While they're all distinguished by color, artwork and iconography, it might have been better if there was more contrast or the icons were bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the wood and metal icons, oddly enough, are a little too similar. Yeah, especially based on the size. Like, I kind of wish I get that this game's about the artwork and the evocative feel, but I almost would have preferred if the hexes were just giant icons that showed me what they produce and started trying to give me a look of an actual landscape with mountains and villages on it. And I, I just feel the compromise, like maybe make those icons take up half the hex. I don't know. So it's the one improvement I would say. Now, before we move on, I also think it's worth noting that Stonemeyer offers a wide variety of ways to upgrade these components. Uh, the most famous and most popular are the metal coins, but you can also get realistic looking resources as well to replace the wooden ones. In addition to official upgrades, Etsy and similar sites are filled mm -hmm. with a wide variety of side upgrades and inserts. Now, speaking of inserts, the box itself or side, the insert it comes with works rather well. Uh, it's mainly designed to keep the miniatures and plastic components from getting damaged or bent. Now, the weird thing is the game came with two really well-designed plastic resource trays, which is great, but it's odd there's two of them because there are four resource types in the games as well as other counters that I would like in those type of containers. Now, oddly, if you back the Kickstarter, I guess you got four. So I don't know. There was some compromise there to give us two of them, whatever it is. Um, I do have to say, though, at this point, just owning the base game, I don't feel any need to look for a third party box insert, though, based on the number of expansions are out there and how tight my box already fits. That may change if I ever pick up some expansions. All right. Well, I think that's about enough what you uh, enough about what you get when you pick up Sutton. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to an overview of play. Now, this overview is not meant to be a full gameplay teach. Scythe is a meaty game with a weight approaching four on Board Game Geek. So what we're going to do, try and do is give you an idea, just a rough overview of how the game plays so you can judge if it sounds like something your group might enjoy. For a look at the setup and full gameplay of Scythe, we both recommend you check out Rodney Smith's Scythe How to Play video on YouTube. Now, for all the stuff you get in the box, I got to say Scythe is pretty quick to set up and get going. You lay out the board. Each player gets a faction assigned randomly and takes the appropriate faction mat and all the components for that faction. They then sit so they can reach the faction's home base on the board. Each player then gets a random player mat, which they pair with their faction. And that's kind of your playing area. Now, the rules as written say to do this randomly. But since Scythe has been out, many people have played it and reported problems with certain combinations. Jamie, the designer of the game, has published a list of banned combinations. These are Crimea Patriotic and Rusviet Industria. Jamie says that if you draw either of these combinations, you should return your player mat to the pool and draw another. Something I would not worry about for your first couple plays, but once you actually have figured out the intricacies of Scythe, you probably want to pay attention to that. I guess those two combinations, you can win the game way quicker than expected. You can get your stars out a little too quick. More about that later. Next, players are going to set up their boards with all their components, which honestly is pretty easy to do because the boards are nice and two layered, and it's pretty easy to see what goes where. On the main board, like uh, the main board, not your personal board, the, everyone is going to mark their starting popularity and power, and everyone will place their character on their faction's base with two workers in the hexes adjacent to that base. Honestly, even if you haven't played before, you're probably going to be able to get most of your components in the right place, though you've got about a 50-50 chance of getting your cubes in the wrong place. Yes. Now, a game of Scythe has no set round limit. The game is played until one player is able to place their sixth star on the board. The game ends immediately when this happens, to some player's chagrin. Stars are earned for a wide variety of reasons, which we'll get into in a bit. You just need to know if the game ends after six stars are placed. And this is actually a very big deal. 
It allows you as a player to control the game in a way that's somewhat unique, deciding whether or not you want to rush to the end when you see an opportunity or try to draw it out as long as you can to perhaps recover from mm -hmm. some earlier mistakes. Now, each turn inside, you're going to move your action token to one of the four regions on your player board. You're then going to get the chance to do the action listed at the top of your board in that region, followed by the action at the bottom of the board. Now, there are four different top actions and four different bottom actions, and every player board features these in a unique combination, one of the first asymmetric aspects of the game. In general, top actions get you stuff and let you do stuff on the map, whereas the bottom actions let you build things and put new things in play. But that's just a generalization. Now, here's where things are going to have to stay pretty high level, or else this will become a two-hour review. <laughs> Each action lists a cost and what you get for that cost in the form of one or more benefits. Some of these costs and benefits start the game covered up, and by taking certain actions, you'll move things from one place to another or out onto the map, and this will therefore change the cost or improve future benefits. Yep. Similarly, building mechs will unlock faction-specific abilities. Again, when you move a mech off, there's something underneath them. Yep. So all of this makes way more sense when you see it right in <laughs> front of you. The fact is, you need to play the game and experiment. There is no way to completely teach it. Well, hopefully this will make a little more sense when I explain what the actions are. I'm going to start with the top actions. So one of the first top actions is trade. Spend a coin to gain resources or popularity. If you built your armory, you can also gain some power. Resources are needed to take the bottom actions and actually build things as well as being worth money at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. Popularity is a big part of the game. Scoring and power is used during battles. An interesting twist in Scythe is that any resources you collect are actually placed on the board, on the map. Mm -hmm. You need a unit with them to spend them, and you're going to want to protect your resources from other players. Now, produce is another way to gain resources and is based on where your workers are on the map, with each of the different types of hexes producing different resources. And one of we mentioned there's four resources, well, there's also cities. Cities produce more workers. Now, the cost for this goes up the more workers you have in play. If you get all your workers out in play, you earn one of those valuable stars. You start by being only able to produce in two hexes in action, but that can be improved and building a mill can generate you resources without a worker. A bolster is a way to improve your power or gain combat cards, both needed if you plan on getting in a fight. You can also gain popularity if you built your monument. You earn a star if you hit the top of the power track and or the top of the popularity track, gaining two if you get to the top of both. Now, combats happen during movement and are always one player versus another. Players spend power and can add in combat cards based on how many plastic units are in a fight. The only random factor here is what combat cards players have, which vary in value from two to five, with twos being more common. Now, you earn a star for the first two combats you win, which is interesting, as after that, there's no real incentive to get in a fight. Now, movement is the final top action and lets you move two units each one hex. The ability to move more units can be unlocked, as can the ability to move further and the ability to move through tunnels, which connect various different areas of the map, making them adjacent to each other. If when moving, your character lands on a spot with an exploration token, they have to stop, you draw the top card from the deck and resolve it. These are actually a lot of fun and give you three options, usually something small and free, something with a bit of a cost that's usually worth it, and something absolutely horrible you can do to the people of the land that gives you something awesome, but for a big popularity hit. Now, there are a number of movement restrictions in place at the beginning of the game, including rivers on the map, uh, moving into controlled areas and more. Each faction has its own way to cross the rivers that has to be unlocked by building the right mech. Now, some factions also have units that can swim, and the factory offers another way to move. Now, that's it for the top actions. So those are your four choices. Every turn, you're going to pick from one of those four. Now, moving on to the bottom actions, we have upgrade. This costs oil and lets you move a cube on your player board from the top action to a bottom action. What that does is it makes the top action more effective and it makes the bottom action you choose cheaper. Now note, you don't have to move a cube from the same area on top to the same area on bottom. 
You right. can pick any combination of bottom and top action to improve. If you manage to move all of your upgrade cubes, you earn a star. Now, deploy is how you get mechs on the board. Each faction has four mechs they can build, and building each unlocks faction-specific powers. Mechs cost metal to build and are your main combat units, but are also great for transporting farmers and resources. Mm -hmm. If you manage to build all four of your mechs, you earn a star. The build action costs wood and lets you build one of your four buildings. There is one of these in each action spot on your player board. Monuments earn you popularity, mill produces resources, the mine lets you travel through the tunnels, and the armory gives you power. In addition to this, buildings give you control of an area, which can be an important for resource management and end game scoring. scoring. Plus, if you build all of your buildings, you earn a star. Star Salad. There you go. Scythe is a star salad game. Now, the final bottom action is in list, and honestly, this is the most confusing one in the game. This lets you take a recruit token from your player board and put it on your faction board. This does two things. First, you get an instant reward based on what you cover up. Then for the rest of the game, you get a bonus whenever you or your opponents to your left and right take the action the recruit came from. Plus, you can earn a star for placing all of your recruits on the faction board. Now, along with these actions, there is a way to unlock a fifth option. If you successfully move your character into the factory, that's the middle of the board, you get to pick a factory card. This gives you a new action with a spot, a uh, new action spot to choose with a really powerful top action, generally better than anything else in the game so far, and a bottom action that is a new move action that lets you move only one unit, but twice in a row. Now, having a second way to move can be a huge thing mm -hmm. in this game. In addition to this, the factory counts as three territories when scar scoring area control at the end of the game, which is a giant deal. Yes. Now, one thing you can do on your turn besides just taking your actions is complete a private objective. You get two of these at the start of the game, and if you fulfill the requirements at the end of your turn, you can turn it in or a star. Second card is then discarded. You can only do one of your two private objectives. So as a reminder, here are all the things you can do to earn a star. Complete all six upgrades. Deploy all of your mechs. Build all of your structures. Enlist all of your recruits, have all of your workers on the board, complete a private objective, win up to two combats, hit maximum popularity, and hit maximum power. Now remember, the game ends when you achieve six. There are ten different ways to do this. You can't do them all. Now once anyone earns that six star, the game ends. You enter a final scoring round. Note, the player doesn't have to get, even get to finish their turn when this happens, but you do finish whatever action it is you're doing that earns you that star. No one else gets in a final turn. You don't go around the board. You don't go to the start player or anything like that. The game just ends. This can be a shock to new players and possibly infuriating to even experienced <laughs> players, but it is part of the strategy. This is the one aspect of the game my wife will probably continue to hate anytime we play. Now, remember how at the start of this, I said, the only thing that matters is money. Well, you take all the coins you earn during the game. You then add that to some bonus coins. Now, the main place these come from are three categories. The amount of bonus coins is actually determined by how high up you are on the popularity track, with more points being earned for the higher up you are. The first bonus is for every star you placed. You multiply your total stars by the bonus amount and take that much money. So all of these are going to be multiplied by the bonus amount. The second is for every territory you control. Note, this includes any territory with your farmers or your units in them, as well as spot hexes with your buildings, but no opponent's units. And don't forget that factories were three. Finally, you're going to add up how many resources you control on the board. Remember, you have to control the hex with the resources to count them. Unguarded resources aren't worth anything, and you get cash for every two resources you have gathered. Now, there's one last way to get a few bonus bucks. You're going to get some kind of bonus coins based on where you built your four buildings during the game, if you built your four buildings. 
Uh, this part's interesting because it's randomly determined at the start of the game what you get it for. And there's things like building in a straight line, building near the tunnels, and so forth. The player with the most wealth wins, with $75 being considered a good score. And then from the designer, he says, if you're getting over 100 reg regularly, you're probably playing something wrong. So that's worth noting once you do sit down to play a game aside. Now, one thing we didn't get into at all is that this is a very asymmetric game and each faction and each player board is unique. They give you different amounts of starting power, popularity, money, and combat cards. The cost and rewards for taking bottom actions actually vary by each player board, each rewarding a different style of play. And also, while we did mention it earlier, the player boards have different combinations of top and bottom actions. Mm -hmm. And that can really, really change your strategy. Then there's the fact that every faction is unique with its own game-breaking abilities, yep. some of which are unlocked right from the start, and others that you unlock by building mechs. Finally, I think it's also worth noting that the game comes with an achievement sheet that you can fill out after each game. This has a number of entries on it with things like win a game without building mechs, be the first to win with each faction, have six stars, but don't win, and so on. Now, I think that's a pretty fair overview of play. Now it's time to move on to our thoughts on side. So we started this entire review today talking about how it was a long-awaited long review. Uh, the short background on that is that I played Scythe back when it was the new hotness, and it wasn't a great experience. I played two games with a group of hardcore cutthroat gamers who had played the game many times before I showed up. This was a game with many gotcha moments. Ha ha ha, you made the classic mistake on focusing on your personal goals. Oh, you forgot the factory I took from you in the last turn was worth three? Ha 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 ha. It wasn't quite that bad, but you know what? That's the impression I was left with after getting totally stomped, mainly to just not knowing the game well enough to play well and be competitive. Now, Mo has mentioned this a number of times on our show, and pretty much every time someone, someone in the chat, one of our Patreon patrons, someone in our Discord, or just some random gamer on Twitter would call out that he should give it another shot. Yeah, it's true. I've had many people try to convert me over to Scythe, and in general, I wasn't willing to give it another shot. I definitely wasn't going to go out and spend 125 Canadian on a game I didn't enjoy on my first play just to try it again. Now, I will say here, if it wasn't for COVID, I probably would have tried it again somewhere. I've had people offer to bring copies to cons so we could sit down and play together. I'm sure I could have gotten to play at an Enter Life event or at the CG Realm, might have had a demo copy or something. But... As it stood, it wasn't until Jamie offered us up a review copy that I finally did give it another go. At. And in doing so, figured out exactly what went wrong in that first play. There's far too much going on inside for anyone to fully grok it after just one or two plays. The problem with my first experience wasn't really size fault or even the cutthroat players I was playing with. It was the, the, the perfect storm of both. No one should be tossed headfirst into a shark tank of experienced players for the first game aside. This is a game that's best learned by experience and playing around. Not trying to tread water and figure out how to swim. Now, even Jamie himself, the designer of the game, recognizes this and addresses it in the rulebook by encouraging exploration during your first mm -hmm. few plays. The reference card even has some recommended first actions that include things like take a top action no one else has taken, just to see what it does. See, that's what I missed out on. I miss getting to discover and explore the game. That's what changed when I got my own copy and presented it to my regular gaming group. Our first game of Scythe was extremely casual, and we just had fun with it. We followed those recommended actions. We literally went down the line. Oh, take an action no one else has taken. Well, how about you take that? Well, no one's done this yet. Why don't we try that? And I got to say, it was probably the longest game of side played any ever by any group. But it was a game that let all four of us slowly figure things out on our own. And it was after that first game that I started to see the appeal of side. This is the entire thing with side. There is a lot going on. Mm -hmm. The actual actions in the game are simple enough to learn. The whole top and bottom action thing is very well done and pretty cool in play. And the asymmetric nature if the game of the game is fantastic. 
Mm -hmm. but you can't possibly see how it all works together until you've sat down and played it a few times. Yeah, I agree completely. It wasn't until that overly long exploration game I started to see how the player boards work differently. I've got to admit, those first plays, I didn't even realize that each one emphasized a different style of play. Heck, I didn't even notice that my bottom actions were different from someone else or the fact that they had different costs. Like if he built a mech, he gets a buck. If I build a mech, I get three. Or it only cost him two wood to build buildings. I actually just thought that they mixed up what was paired. I didn't realize there was more to it than that. And that's not to mention all the stuff I discovered while playing. Like why you may want to do one thing or another or how important it is to protect your resources. Because I got to say, I missed that the first game. And there was that ha ha ha, you left these sitting here moment. Or the fact you can go an entire game without a single combat and it still works. This is important to note. Despite having a map and units on it, Scythe is not a folk on a map war game. Oh. Uh, and I think uh, one of the big things is the, the appearance of mechs is mm -hmm. one of those things that, that pushes people towards it being that combat yes, war game. I agree. While combat can be part of the game, it's very much not the focus. No. As we mentioned earlier, the biggest incentive to combat is earning those first two stars. And after that, it's just not usually worth the cost or risk, unless someone happens to leave a big juicy stack of resources just sitting there. Yeah, there, there are, are sometimes other reasons, but really it's not. And you know what? They tried to get it across on the cover by showing like half battle and half farms. And I think that people focus on the mechs without realizing the brightest part of the box is people gathering resources. But so there were definitely hints there. Now, something we did skip over during the rule summary is that whenever you attack a territory with farmers, you lose popularity for each one that runs away. And I've got to say, this is another thing that really deters combat, right? Because this can be a huge deterrent. Because popularity can be a massive hit to your score. Now, if everyone's around the same area, sure. And I, I totally want to play the game where everyone plays low popularity, but it hasn't happened. As long as someone starts trying to get up there on the popularity track, the rest of the group probably has to follow to be competitive. This game is much more about planning your actions and making sure you have the resources on hand to maximize your turns. Mm -hmm taking advantage of both the top and the bottom actions on your board as often as possible. Mm -hmm. It's also about figuring out what your board and faction are good at and mm -hmm. leaning into that as well as taking advantage, advantage of your faction's unique abilities. And then, of course, there's a game mastery of once you figured out your faction's advantages, what are your opponents and what are they going to try to do? And this is why... I try to say that like this is not a, a quick to learn, easy to play. You're going to get it right away game. Like even the fact that each faction has a different version of the Riverwalk ability greatly impacts what parts of the board players are going to have access to and how quickly they can expand. Now, another big part of side is the order that you do things in and whether you do them at all which can greatly affect gameplays. Do you rush to get your mechs out or do you bother to build tunnels? Do you get all your recruits out early to take advantage of your neighbors taking bottom actions? Like I said, there's just a lot going on in this game. And actually, that's one icon that has been known to cause some confusion. That's the river walk. Yeah. Though, honestly, I'm not sure what else they could do without making it needlessly complex. It does. It has led to some confusion. Yes, it shows where you can move into, not where you can go back and forth from. Is about the best I can say for people who may be playing Scythe wrong. I'll admit we got it wrong. Now, some other highlights in Scythe include a very well-written rulebook, an excellent FAQ online. Uh, one, I admit, we didn't have to reference too often, but it was good. It was there for a couple of edge cases. Uh, component quality, where we talked about quite a bit, it's awesome. And I love the fact that it matters what's plastic and what's wood. It makes it so much easier to teach certain parts of the game. Like all of your mech abilities apply to your leader and your mech. It's a way easier to say, if a piece is plastic, it affects these. If a piece is wood, it it can produce resources. Like I love that. I dig that that's there. It's, it's good as a reminder and it's great for teaching the game. As we've noted, this is a fantastic tool in games and something Arnak as an example does well as also to help differentiate those components and different purposes. I also really appreciate the achievement sheet, uh, though I have to say we haven't filled ours out. We probably should have. We probably should have broke it out the first game, no matter if it was a learning game or not. Uh, but it was looking at that that had me discover more aspects of the game. 
like the one that says you can't win without building mechs. And I looked at the board and I'm like, how can you, how can you do that? That means no river walk. How do I get to the center of the board? How would I even get off my peninsula? And then actually trying to play a game going, okay, this game, I'm not going to build any mechs. And I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot. The tunnel. Why didn't I even think of that? Right. But like without reading that achievement, I made a never made that connection. Never game built mechs every time without realizing that it's even possible to win without them. And I, I really dig that sheet for kind of opening my eyes to new things. And we mentioned this in our making board games more like video games episode. It's just a great way to help players think outside the box mm -hmm. and consider other potential paths to victory. And I also like the combat system here. It's almost deterministic, right? It's it's almost whoever has the most power wins is, is kind of it. So there's a limit. Everyone can only spend a max of seven, which is kind of an interesting choice. So once you're all up there, you all have about the same power. And when you enter a fight, you know exactly how much power your opponents has. You know how many combat cards they have. And right there printed on the board is the distribution of those combat cards. You can play the odds in your head. Often you're going to know exactly how much power you need to spend, and how much they need to spend. And even when it's a win, though, there's this bluffing back and forth. Like, yeah, I'm going to beat you. But are you going to spend seven so I have to spend eight? just to deplete my resources or are you going to spend one and run away? So I waste a bunch and trying to figure that out. Like I really dig that back and forth. Also the fun little wheel component, which hold, which also holds the cards. is just a nice touch too. Yeah, it is. It works better than you would expect though. You tell people don't, you don't have to put the cards face down because then you just got to flip them. Just don't let me see it ahead of time. Um, now this bluffing does lead me to a part of side. We did not mention above, and this is something that I'll admit the groups I usually play with don't really tend to use this rule. I pointed out it exists, but it just doesn't tend to come up inside. You are allowed to negotiate and make deals and alliances. You can even trade coins. Remember money is all that matters at the end of the game. So you're trading victory points. You can literally bribe other players to do things, make deals. Like I'm going to attack you and take all your, your wheat. Unless you give me six coins, that is a valid move in a game of side. Now, no, none of these contracts are binding, so you can't do that. I'm going to give you seven bucks to go attack her, and then they don't go attack her. Well, that might lead to some infighting. And there's where you get into the problems and potentials of games like Diplomacy or Risk. They're all present here. Now, I think most people listening know I'm not a big fan of these types of mechanics and games, so we've mostly stayed away from them in our games. But I am sure some groups out there love this diplomatic aspect of side. This is potentially what might make the game less universal than some others. Mm -hmm. The sheer variety of play styles could really make the game so startlingly different between different groups True. and group dynamics. A cutthroat, aggressive player could sit down at our table and be bored to tears with our play style. Yeah. No, I'm not taking your money. Nope, I'm not taking your money. It'd be like sitting down to play Catan with that player who never trades, right? They probably hate it. Meanwhile, other groups, I'm sure you'd sit down and be like, wait, what do you mean you're bribing him to do that? I'm like, it's legal by the rules. I have a feeling there's people out there that don't know that is by the book. Now, before we go on to some final thoughts, I do want to talk a bit about playing side solo. This is a game that plays one to five. Now, I am not someone you should consider a solo gamer, but in order to be fair and do a complete review, I did want to try the solo game. And I will admit I did it at the easiest difficulty just to give it a shot. Now, while I've played solo on Steam, I was playing against computer opponents, and that doesn't really quite count. So I do wonder, does the Steam have the Atama version to play? I, you know what? I, I didn't have time to check. Yeah, that. I just wonder if there, there was a way to do it. So anyway, we're talking about the physical game anyway, not the Steam version. If you want a Steam review, maybe we'll do that sometime. So Solo Play and Scythe uses a 19-card driven AI. As a player, you play exactly the same game. It, you literally play it the same as you play Scythe but your opponent's actions are determined by the cards and they ignore many of the core rules of the game. For example, they don't generate or use resources. They don't build buildings or have things like faction powers. Instead, they start with a character and two workers in play. The remaining max stars workers on their faction board. No player board needed. They don't take actions at all. Well, that's certainly better than trying to play multiple factions at once and all that would entail. Very true. Now, after each of your turns, you flip over the top Atoma card, which will tell you which enemy units move and how to move them, which uses a fairly complicated neighborhood system that I got to say is quite confusing and will take a bit to get used to. 
It was confusing enough that after my play, I went and watched a couple actual plays to see if I got it right. And I think I did in most cases, but I do know I put two workers on the same hex at least once. So I did mess it up a little bit. So it might be a bit rough for the player who just wants a game of Scythe and no one else is around. But for a more regular solo player, it should become pretty straightforward with play. Yeah, I agree. Now, this movement may trigger a combat. You do your part of the combat the same. You grab a combat wheel, decide how much power to spend, and add any applicable combat cards. For the AI, though, you flip another card from that deck and you look at this gauge on the side. This determines how much power they're willing to spend and how many combat cards they will use, if any. The winner gets a star as usual, with enemy units being retreated to the faction board, not their base. That is something I messed up in my play. When winning a fight or scaring away farmers, which is a part of the play, you get a random number of resources. Again, you're going to flip a card and look at the spot on it that shows the resources you get for a combat. Now, based on that last part, is combat more useful in the solo game due to that you know resource bump from every combat? I, honestly, really, it's no different from the core game. Like, unless you're just trying to grab the factory or you're just doing a fight to win a star. Most combat and scythe was over a spot filled with resources. Like, even if you're trying to get that star, you tried to attack somewhere where you're going to get something more out of it. What does seem odd is that it's random. Whereas if I'm playing the real game, I know the stakes going in. I know you're, I'm taking three oil and a, corn, and, and a food from you. Whereas here, I might get something, I might get nothing. Good to know. Now, after moving, the opponent gets stuff. Uh, this could be more units, money, power, combat cards. Next, the card shows recruit icons. This is tied into the whole recruit action we talked about before, where you're moving tubes off your thing and putting on your player board. And basically, it simulates that the, the AI took that action. So if you've unlocked that recruit, you get the reward if it's shown on the card. Now, finally, in the center of the card, there will or won't be a big star. If there's a star, you actually move a counter on a star track. Now, this isn't the star track on the board. There are, I think, four different star tracks included, which are the four different difficulty levels for the Atoma. Um, and the tracks are different. Now, as the counter moves up on this track, the AI eventually gets, um, I, I want to say, water walk, because they could cross all lakes and rivers. And then they start earning stars. And then about uh, two thirds of the way through, you're actually going to take all the Atoma cards and turn them 180 degrees, and the AI becomes more aggressive. And this is the way the Atoma starts getting stars, but they can also still earn them by winning combats as well as hitting the top of the power track. Interesting timing system, but also a good way to parcel out the rewards to the AI. Yeah. Now, just like a normal game, solo play ends as soon as someone places their sixth star, whether it's you or the AI. Points are then calculated pretty much the same as normal. The, the AI doesn't actually build buildings or have resources, so it won't get any points for those. Now, I wonder, how did your score compare to group play? It feels like scoring might be a little higher in solo. Uh, well, I did exceptionally well, which makes me wonder if I did anything else wrong. Um, I did watch some videos, and it seems like the only thing I actually mixed up mainly was I was in the AI's favor. When I was defeating units, I was putting them on the base. Meanwhile, they shouldn't have been coming back out until a card told me to put them out. But I had over 100 wealth, and the AI was in the 50s. I didn't quite double, but it was really close. Um, now, this was on the easiest Atoma, where many of the cards you just ignore and the AI doesn't take a turn. Maybe I've now played enough games aside them just that good. I don't know. Uh, but like I said, the movement system for the AI is quite involved, and I could have easily messed something up. I and did, I do admit, I only tried it once. I did see some suggestion that the solo, solo, solo scores were higher, but it may actually just be the player skill and faction combination. Yeah. And I will admit, I took a faction that I did not take a popularity hit for attacking farmers. And I think that's extremely powerful versus the AI. And I use that to get the majority of my resources during my game. So I honestly do think that could have been part of it as well. Now, overall, playing solo, it was OK. Uh, again, I only gave it one shot. I know we said we like to try things five times, but I didn't do that for the solo play. Sorry, but at least I'm talking about it. I would much rather play a game with real opponents, but it's nice to have. It's a nice option. Um, it's simple enough overall, though, again, the movement rules are a little weird. Um, I suggest anyone trying to try it, watch a video or two just to make sure you're getting it right. Um, I appreciate that there's an option to play solo, and I really dig that there's actually different difficulty levels, though I doubt I'll be trying them out myself. 
It's interesting to note that online you can find ways to play with more than one Atoma character, mm. though you do need a separate deck for each. And there are even rules for playing with a mix of multiple humans and Atoma. Mm. Now, not something we really tried or plan on trying, though it actually seems to be the preferred way to play solo in the BGG forums uh, against two player, two Atoma. Uh, the preferred mm -hmm. method seems to be there's an app called Scythe Kick. You. Uh, both available on both iOS and uh, Android, and that manages your Atoma for you and makes it a little easier on you. Sounds interesting. Again, I'll, I'll take humans. I'll play against humans. <laughs> All right, overall, Scythe, to me, is the perfect example of a board game that can't be judged based on only a couple of plays. This is a big, meaty game that is best approached slowly and explored along with a group that's also new to the game. And I know that's not gonna be able to happen for everyone. While each individual action and system in this game is easy to understand, seeing the big picture and how things interact is not. In this world of one and done games, Scythe almost fails. Yeah. Obviously enough people liked it on their initial play that it grew to be as popular as it is. But I'm sure there are plenty of gamers out there that mm. gave up after their first play, as Mo almost did. True. Uh, yeah, this is a game not to be taken lightly. It's not going to be a game for people who aren't willing to sit down and learn the ins and outs of the game and develop some form of game mastery over multiple plays. Now, the thing is, though, if you're willing to put in that work, Scythe comes out as a fantastic game. It has a ton of depth, depth. Near infinite, uh, I, I screw up depth and now I can't talk. <laughs> it has a ton of depth, near infinite replayability due to the different faction combinations of vector cards and events, and a huge breadth of strategies and ways to play, all of which seem totally valid. Jamie himself said it well on Board Game Geek by saying, It is a game, not a puzzle. It cannot be solved. Nice. Yeah, personally. I'm very happy, all you fans, all you Bellhop fans, those of you in the lobby who convinced me to give Scythe another shot. I now finally understand how it's ranked in the top games in the world right now. I think I'm Borging you was number 16 last time I looked. It's official at this point. I am a Scythe convert. You won me over. You got me. Well, that's it for our review of Scythe from Stonemeyer Games. If you enjoyed this review, please consider showing your support at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Now, what's a game that you weren't sold on at first, but that you grew to love over more plays? We'd love to hear about it in the comments. Now that we're done here, I do also invite you to check out my written review of Scythe over at tabletopbellhop.com. There I can get into a bit more detail about some of the mechanics and share some picks from our gameplays.